That's enough out of you. A weekly podcast where you'll hear the truth, or at least a closer version of the truth, than most of the bullshit that's out there. Here are your hosts, Bill Rader and Sean Kane. Hello and welcome to That's Enough Out of You. I'm your host, Bill Rader. I'm Sean Kane. And this is a weekly podcast where we talk about all kinds of things. We talk about sports. We talk about history. We talk about sports history. We talk about current events and pop culture and true crime and mafia and Sean, all kinds of stuff. And historical figures like JFK, RFK, MLK. And actually, JFK is going to be a big part of this month. Uh, what, what we're doing this month, we're kicking off a, a big month with uh, special episodes and uh, a very special guest, which we'll tell you about. Um, but uh, yeah, everything uh, everything's going pretty good uh, with the podcast so far, Sean. How you doing? I'm doing good, buddy. Yeah, getting great feedback on the, on the podcast. And just want to tell our listeners to remember, hit that like button, hit subscribe share this podcast, give us a review, hit the notification bell uh, to get updated on future episodes. Absolutely. Yeah. We got some great, uh, great feedback where um, we got some, some good ratings and, and reviews on the, the episodes that we already have up and running. We actually got some, uh, we got an email from, from a listener. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I would encourage you guys. We have that YouTube channel where we, where uh, we have all of our episodes are, are up and running on, on YouTube. Uh, so if you want to go out there, make sure you hit subscribe because uh, that's going to make sure that you get updated on all of our latest episodes. It also helps out the show and it's, and it doesn't cost it? the viewer or the listener a dime bill. Not a penny. It's, it's absolutely penny. free. All you got to do is click that red subscribe button and uh, make sure that you're, you're subscribed to that's enough out of you. Just search on YouTube for that's enough out of you. And uh, it'll bring up our podcast. And like I said, you'll get uh You'll get all the all the latest episodes. In fact, you'll get our episode uh, a day early because what we plan on doing is putting the regular episodes up, uh, the weekly episodes up a day early on YouTube. So if you're if you want to get out there and hear hear the podcast before the just uh, the regular podcast listeners do, you can go go to YouTube. Um, but yeah, some some great feedback. I'll. Actually, I'm going to read you, uh, we got an email, Sean, I'm going to read you the, the email we got from a listener. This comes from Ozman. Hey, buddy. And uh, Ozman writes, just listen to both episodes of the new show. Very good. I have to say my favorite episode of Sopranos was Pine Barrens. Uh, favorite character was Uncle June. Favorite scenes was when Pauly and Syl went to, uh, to Richie uh, to build a ramp on Beansy's house. That was a great scene. That was a great scene. I don't know if you remember that one, Sean. They, when they went to uh, to tell Richie that he had to build the ramp so that Beansy could could get into his house with the wheelchair. Oh, that was classic. That was that great. Was classic. Uh, so yeah, good. Uh, and then uh, he has a recommendation for the show. So uh, he said once in a while highlight some of the old school mafioso individuals like the uh, like Genovese, Vito Genovese, and uh, Joe Gallo, Anastasia, Gotti, Col- Columbo, we list a whole bunch of them here. We plan on doing that. Absolutely. I mean, we we'll do shows on each one of these guys. Yeah, um, we're we're gonna do a lot of mafioso. I'm I'm uh, working on a show on Sam G and Kana right now, and then uh, Jimmy Hoffa. So yeah, expect a lot of uh, organized crime figures and mafioso. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's gonna be one of our big topics on this show. So if you're interested in in mafia, you're interested in. Uh, you know, those old school OGs, right? Original gangsters, those kind of guys, you'll, you'll, you'll get a lot of that on this show. So stay tuned, keep, keep, uh, keep subscribed to us. And then, uh, and then Osman ends, ends his email with, um, uh, Sean, you have to watch Breaking Bad, excellent show and Ozark too. And I've been telling you that for a long time. Yeah, you have been Billy. All right, Osman, I'll put it on my list. <laughs> definitely breaking bad definitely is a is a must watch sean I, I'm, i've got okay. it absolutely is a great show and i'd love to do a, a, a podcast on, on breaking bad all right, all right buddy. and then uh yeah we're getting some really good uh, good feedback we got some good reviews on uh on the apple podcast uh podcatcher um 
let me see. Let me, I'll just read a couple of them here. Uh, let's see. We got great. Uh, this one comes from Angelome 1972. Great first show. I loved it. Can't wait for the next. Uh, let's see. J.R. Eldor says uh, compelling and provocative topics with informative hosts. Highly recommend. And then uh, let me see. There's a couple other good ones. Oh, this one comes from Marilyn Sue. It says required listening. Bill and Sean remind us how important it is to look back and understand why we are where we are now. It's refreshing to hear a solid perspective on what uh, what almost seems to be a forgotten era. So great feedback. We're, we're really happy that uh, you guys are listening and happy with the show so far and uh, just encourages us to keep going. So yeah, that's tremendous feedback. We thank everybody. And uh, we just want to tell everybody a lot of great content still to come. Yeah, including today. So, um, all right, let's get into our let's get into our topic for today, Sean. Well, Bill, this month we're going to do all uh, JFK assassination episodes um, for the anniversary, which is coming up. So, let's just start with the basics. You know, um, November twenty second, nineteen sixty three, uh, JFK is assassinated in Dealey Plaza. Um, he's driving uh, in a limo with his wife, Jackie, and with Governor Conley and his wife. And he's, he's shot and killed. And Governor Conley is, is wounded also. And then about an hour later, uh, ex-Marine by the name of Lee Harvey Oswald is arrested for killing a policeman by the name of J.D. Tippett. Um, and then on November 24th, um, Oswald is shot by a nightclub owner named Jack Ruby in the basement of the Dallas police department where, you know, he's surrounded by like 75 cops with, with their hand on their, their pockets and yeah. uh, nobody does nothing. Right. Yeah. And I mean, that's, you know, that's the, the basic, right. That's, that's just the facts. That's the facts. And then the interesting thing, Bill, is that you had all this confusion going on. And uh, when the TV shows are being interrupted um, immediately, they're saying, you know, three shots are fired at president Kennedy's limo. And the thing that always got me is like, there's so many uh, confusing reports coming because there's so many people that are saying there was four shots, there was five. Um, so why, you know, if right off the bat, they're focused on three shots, you know, right, right off the bat. Yeah. The, the thing that I want to point out, Sean, is that it was such a different time th that, 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 you know, news media was such a different, it was such a different era because don't forget, this was 1963. There were three networks there. You had to wait until the evening news or the late news in order to get information on things that happened that day. It isn't like today where we find out the second after something happens, we find out about it because we get a notification on our phone we go right to CNN or, you know, one of these other 24 hour news networks and we just sit there and watch and the coverage is constant and it come, you know, they get information and we hear the information as it comes in. The president of the United States was shot. They broke in on, on television for about a couple of minutes and then went back to regularly scheduled programming, which was like a soap opera or something. I can't even remember, Sean. I don't know if you, if you have those details. Yeah, it was like soap operas and stuff. I, I forget, Bill. But remember, there was only like the three networks back then. Right, exactly. You know? And so if you if you happen to be watching television at that time and you heard that report, I can't imagine what, must, what people must have been thinking. Like, oh, my God, the president was shot and we don't know what's happening. We don't know if he's alive. We don't know if he's dead. We don't know what, what's going on. We're going to have to wait. And I don't know how long it was before they broke back in with um, and, and I, you know, the coverage that everybody remembers is um, Walter Cronkite. Right. Cronkite. Yeah. And the uh, the the feed that they had, they had a telephone feed from Dallas to, uh, you know, to the studio in New York. And it was, it was just chaos. Nobody really knew what was going on. They were hearing reports of this and that. And the, 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 the average person was just sitting, you know, in front of their television or listening 
on the radio to try to get any kind of information, any kind of report that they could, that they could, that they could hear. It was just a crazy, crazy time. Oh, it was unbelievable. I mean, just, just craziness, you know, but the thing is there was a, a local man by the name of Abraham Zapruder and he was filming um, the, the motorcade at the time. So he got the assassination on film. And the interesting thing, Bill, is the American people didn't see this uh, film because Time Life ended up buying it, okay? Now, the interesting thing about Time Life is they were owned by a guy by the name of Henry Luce. Now, Henry Luce was part of what I call the Eastern Establishment. Um, he was very close to Alan Dulles, who we mentioned on the JFK podcast, and, of course, David Rockefeller. Right. Right. And he was a member of the Skull and Bones which is the, you know, secret group from Yale University. Um, but he's, his wife was uh, Claire Bootloose, who was very close to David Atlee Phillips, okay? And she, she was part of something called the Retired Intelligence uh, Group or something like that that Phillips created after he retired from the CIA, but he was still running operations out of that group. And an uh, investigator by the name of Gaetan Fonzi uh, on the House Select Committee on Assassinations in the 70s, he did a lot of uh, investigating into to the Looses. And he said that Claire Booth Luce sent him on a lot of wild goose chases. And, you know, he was investigating David Atlee Phillips. So you have to ask this question, Bill, is Time Life buys this film for the equivalent of what today would be like $1.3 million. Mm -hmm. And they basically lock it away so that people can't see it. yeah. Okay. When, was it, when was it released to the public, Sean? Well, here's what happened, though. They locked it away, and um, they, they would release, like, still frames, okay, of certain shots that they want to get out, and they put it on the cover of their magazine and stuff. But it was locked away really until the, the next time it would be viewed was uh, during the Jim Garrison trial. Jim right. Garrison subpoenaed it. He subpoenaed them, and he got it uh, just for the trial, so the, the jurors got to see it. OK, but it wasn't shown to the American public until 12 years after when a bootleg copy um, was seen by um, was shown by Geraldo Rivera. OK, and that was 1975. So for 12 years, the American public didn't see it. And the interesting thing is we're told that he shot from behind. And when you see the Zapruder film, you see Kennedy going back into the left. Right. Which clearly shows a shot from the right front, which would be the grassy knoll. Uh, the picket fence, you know, and, and the, the other thing is, you know, I know here we got a little bit of disagreement, uh, but Dan Rather, Dan Rather was, you know, at the time, a small time uh, network in Dallas he was working for, and he would get, you know, he would make his career on this. And one of the things, Dan Rather, he was one of the few people that actually seen the Zapruder film. And he says, and he was right on camera, Bill, he says that, Kennedy's head goes violently forward and he shows the motion of the head going forward. Yeah. Now, when you watch the film, that's a complete lie. Right. Now, right. I know you, me and you had discussions about this. You think, you know, maybe he was nervous, this and that. I mean, I think that's, you know, that's a big discrepancy. I mean, well, he had a long time to correct that and he didn't. Yeah. And, and I also think when he originally said it, it, it's very possible and we don't know the circumstances, but it's very possible that he just saw it the one time probably saw it um you know on a tiny little screen and was probably probably very nervous probably didn't remember everything now that's no excuse he's a reporter he should be telling the truth about everything but i think when it comes and we all know this when it comes to eyewitness recollection sometimes that can be pretty fuzzy so i don't know i'm not going to fault dan rather for the initial report it's the fact that he backed it up time and time and time again and said, you know, I saw what I saw. His, his head went forward. Clearly, we all know that it went back. And if, if we're talking about the Zapruder film, I, I guess I'm sure that I saw it growing up. Um, but the, the first time that I really remember having it picked apart and, and explained to me was, uh, and I think I've told this story before, when I was going to school at, at Penn State, this was in the very early 90s, I think it was 90 or 91, and the local Penn State campus here 
and a guy by the name of Jim Mars came to uh, came to do a presentation. And he, Jim Mars, Sean, you know, you know that name very well. He's a very well known author. Wrote the book Crossfire, among among some other books. Yes, he's a tremendous author. You know, passed away a few years ago. And so he actually came to to our campus and and did a presentation and showed on a very large uh, screen, showed the Zapruder film and paused it essentially frame by frame, showing us what was happening. And it was, it was shocking to me because I had never really even thought about doing that, but he really showed us, okay, here's where the first shot hit. Here's where Kennedy, where his head went backwards. And he kind of zoomed in on the essentially a chunk of his skull a chunk of his head flying off the back and Jackie climbing to the back of the limo to pick it up so that it didn't fall out onto the street she essentially was climbing on the back of the limo grabbed the, his head and brought it back in to the to the limousine it was an open open limousine there was it wasn't like today where you know the the president is essentially in a bulletproof tank this was a car that it was a convertible car and the roof was open for all the world to see and for all the world to, to shoot, which is essentially what happened. And, um, you know, the, we, we saw that in very graphic detail because of the Zapruder film, because of this, this man, Jim Mars, this author who, who, you know, who explained it to us. And that was among other things, kind of the first, the first time that I started to doubt and started to wonder and started to think, okay, this, this story that I've been told my entire life, that it was this one lone nut, this one gunman uh, who shot the president because of whatever reason and was perched in, in the top of this building and shooting out the window through a tree. Uh, it, it, it was a lie. It, it wasn't true. And this was really, for me, the first first time that I started to to realize that. And yeah. then... Go ahead, Bill. And then, no, and then I saw the film. I saw JFK, and I know we, we're going to talk about that. Yeah, we're going to get into the film. But yeah, for me, Bill, the, the, you know, the first time, really, when I was young, I just remember listening to the conversation with my dad and... and some of my uncles and all of them had military training. And I just remember them saying, you know, that that shot came from the front, that shot didn't come from the back, you know, and that's, that's when I realized, you know, something they're not telling us everything. Right. But, you know, you mentioned the film JFK, you know, which came out in what was it? 90, 91. I believe 91. Yeah. I mean, very yeah. controversial film at the time at the time it was very controversial bill but the interesting thing is like when you look back at that now i mean i think it was kind of understated compared I to agree. what the documentation that we have now i mean and that film was absolutely hammered by the critics even before yep. it came out yep and you know when you compare that film bill to s some other films that are on uh you know supposedly real events like say the untouchables remember the movie the untouchables without right. with uh robert de niro yeah I mean, Another that was a costume movie. Costume movie, yeah, it was a great movie. But you know what? That movie is complete fiction. I mean, ninety-five percent right. of that movie is completely made up. I mean, yeah. they have you know uh, Elliot Ness throwing Frank Nitti off a building into a car. I mean, that never happened. I mean, most of that movie was was fiction. You know, but nobody blasts that movie. You know, so the JFK movie just totally got destroyed by the critics even before you know months before it came out. Bill, oh yeah, they were attacking it. Yeah, I remember that. And, and I remember my father uh, telling me that this was some, you know, it was like it was propaganda. It was, you know, it was it was just a conspiracy, conspiracy theory. And, and it was a, you know, this Oliver Stone is a nut job and he's, you know, this none of this is true. It's 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 all, you know, blown way out of proportion. And my dad, you know, he was some, he was a guy who just, he was alive when, when, when JFK was, was assassinated, he remembered it. And he would tell me what he was told when he was growing up is that it was this guy, it was this, this lone nut. 
And he had a very hard time believing anything else. And, and then I took him and we went and we saw the movie and it changed him. It changed his mind. Well, you know, one of the things about the movie, Bill, is the one of the things that Oliver Stone was getting destroyed on is that he said in the movie, you know, that Kennedy was withdrawn from Vietnam. And all the critics blasted that at the time because, again, we talked about the JFK episode. We talked about his character getting assassinated. And, you know, the, the media always said that, you know, Kennedy was just, you know, Johnson followed Kennedy's policies, this and that. But Oliver Stone knew the truth because he had uh, L. Fletcher Prouty uh, right there uh, assisting him on the film because uh, hmm. Fletcher Prouty was the character of Mr. X in the movie. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you about that, Sean. If, if... Well, Fletcher Prouty Bill was the focal officer between the military and the CIA. So basically he was in charge of making sure that the, the military, that CIA clandestine uh, operations were funded by the military. He was, he was like the middleman between the military and the CIA. Okay. So the other thing about Fletcher Prouty is him and Victor Krulak, General Victor Krulak from the Marine Corps, they actually wrote NSAM 263 that we've talked about uh, on the first episode on JFK, um, which was Kennedy's withdrawal policy. It was, it was Prouty and Krulak who wrote that with the super, under the supervision of Bobby Kennedy, and then they gave it to uh, McNamara, Secretary of Defense, and um, Maxwell Taylor, who Kennedy put in as the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, and they, you know, they, they approved it and everything. But it was Prouty that actually wrote that, you know. So, so here's Oliver Stone. He's got Fletcher Prouty there, so he knows the truth that Kennedy was withdrawn, and he also was um, influenced by a, a professor, John Newman, who was was uh, the assistant Oliver, I believe, and and he wrote a lot of stuff on Vietnam, and he he understands the documents. He was going through the documents, and and he understood that Kennedy was withdrawn from Vietnam. So when the media is bashing him and everything, Oliver's there. He knows the truth because he's getting it from the horse's mouth. You know what I'm right. saying? Yeah. And w when you talk about Mr. X in the movie, what you're talking about is the scene where, for those who may, may have not seen the movie uh, recently, there was a scene where Jim Garrison, who's played by Kevin Costner, gets sort of summoned to, D to D.C., and he meets with um, this shadowy character. Uh, I believe it was, was it at the, the Washington Monument? I, I forget. Uh, it was, Bill. But uh, the thing is, you know, most of the correspondence between Garrison and Prouty were, were done by mail. Right. You know, so and, that's the dramatic effect that Oliver did for the movie, which, you know, people want to hit him on that. I mean, it's still, he's not, you know, telling anything that's not true. As far as the, the the information that Mr. X has given uh, Garrison, you know, it's just that they didn't actually meet there. Right. And this is really, though, the crux of, of the movie. This is this is where because Garrison has his doubts. He's you know, he's starting this investigation. He knows something's not right. And then this this man, Mr. X, reaches out to him and says, <laughs> you're you're on the right track you don't know the t you, all you know is at this point is the tip of the iceberg and bill and, could, could i uh, cut you off real quick and just sure let's just say something real quick about mr rex was played by donald sutherland who was right. just tremendous fantastic i mean he played that role so good i mean he, he was, was just awesome and it was all it was a very short role it was a very she was a cameo essentially but it was so impactful bill it was the most impactful scene in the entire absolutely movie. absolutely and he essentially lays this out for for jim garrison and says here here are all the reasons why i know for a fact this was this was a setup this was not a, a lone gunman in fact he said uh i think he at some point he says that uh uh, that Oswald was, uh, you know, really just a patsy. And he well, said, I think at that point, Bill, like, I think Garrison, once he started to talk to Prouty, 
I think he realized up to that point, he, he seen the assassination as like a local conspiracy. He's right. investigating what happened in New Orleans right. the summer before. But I think after the conversations with Prouty, he understands what a national level this is on. And then he started to realize this conspiracy is a lot bigger than he originally believed. Yeah. And and he was, I think at that point, it probably scared the hell out of him. I can't imagine. Sure, absolutely. I can't imagine it wouldn't because he, he now he's realizing, you know, I'm dealing with powers that I can't contend with. So essentially his focus was on new Orleans. It stayed local. It stayed with what hit, what was within his jurisdiction. But the reason he did it was to open the eyes of the entire country to say, you're being lied to. This isn't just what they told you. And, and what I'm investigating is just a part of it. Well, Bill, he did try to subpoena people like Alan Dulles, you know, but they, right. they got, they got rejected, but yeah. he did. You know, I think that the great thing about Garrison is he, he got vilified in the press. I mean, it's absolutely destroyed, but he basically solved the case at the, the, the mid management level. Right you know, of the assassination conspiracy. He, he basically solved it, but the, the media and the CIA, which at that time was um, headed by Richard Helms. He was the director at that time and he absolutely destroyed Garrison. He went after him. They were bugging his office. I mean, can you imagine bugging the CIA, bugging the, the DA's office? Right. Yep. I mean, they had people, they had uh, uh, plants that they put in his office and they were stealing files from him. I mean, it was just incredible. And he was the way he was attacked in the media. And the interesting thing, Bill, is the, the entire national media is saying Garrison has no case. Garrison is, is crucifying this, this businessman by the name of Clay Shaw. And the thing is, at the time, Richard Helms sent his, sent his people on a fact-finding mission to New Orleans. And they came back to him and they said, basically, that, you know, if we don't interfere and we don't do something, Garrison's left his own devices that he will obtain a, a conviction against Clay Shaw. Now think about that, Bill. Yeah. You know, why do they, first of all, why did it have to interfere? If this is a man who legitimately was involved in killing the president, why do you want to interfere unless you're covering up for one of your own? And we now know from all the documents released, there's no doubt about it that Clay Shaw was, was involved and he was a, you know, high level CIA contract agent. You know, that's confirmed from the documents. Garrison did prove there was a conspiracy they just mm-hmm. didn't think that he proved Clay Shaw was involved beyond a reasonable doubt. Right. And that was because basically, you know, the CIA destroyed his case, Bill. Yeah. You know, the Richard Helms destroyed Jim Garrison in his investigation. And, and really, it was the first time that uh, the Warren Commission was called into question, particularly the magic bullet theory. They picked that apart. Well, yeah, and, and Bill, we'll get into all that. We'll get into more specifics on on yeah. all that in later episodes because oh, we yeah. got some explosive episodes coming up, yep. and then you know it's going to culminate with a with a special guest on the twenty second. Um, so I mean, there's there's just a lot more that we're going to talk about, but just for tonight, you know, just to that that movie was uh, after that movie, people were so upset because at the end, Oliver put in there that the government was hold, still classified all these documents and they were holding them from the people. And that set up what's called the ARB, the Assassinations Record Review Board. And, and there's a lawsuit right now that people have against the CIA because they still haven't uh, released all the documents. And there was, a, there was a court order, Bill, if they were supposed to release the documents and they're still holding back on these documents. And when they do release them, some are redacted. There's supposed to be no redactions. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. But because of that movie, Bill, there's so many interesting things that came out of those documents, you know? Yeah. And one of the things, one of the most interesting things is what we know now is the mayor of Dallas at the time, Bill, was a guy by the name of Earl Cabell. Now, his brother was General Charles Cabell, who was Alan Dulles' number two guy at the CIA. He was an Air Force general. And he was fired by Kennedy, along with Dulles and the number three guy at the CIA, Richard Bissell. They were fired after the Bay of Pigs. So what came out of these documents is not only was uh, Mayor Cabell, you know, his brother, a guy that Kennedy fired, but Mayor Cabell was an asset of the CIA for 10 years, Bill. And that came out and it was 
it was interesting because they put it in a pile. They, like they when they declassified the files, they put them in two two sections: one relevant and one non-relevant. And they put that in the section of non-relevant. Now, how in the world could the mayor of Dallas, being a CIA asset, not be relevant? Relevant. That's amazing. Oh, it's amazing. Well, the thing is, Bill, like I, I'm trying to look into how much involvement did the mayor have in his office in changing the parade route? Because remember, Bill, somebody changed sure. that parade route at the last minute to go past to make that crazy turn um, onto uh, right past the Texas School Book Depository. Right. Where Oswald worked. And where the other there, thing is, the there are open is, windows. There's open windows everywhere. And Mr. X talked about that in the film. About and, and there was an intelligence unit that was called off at the last minute that was supposed to supplement the Secret Service. Yeah. You know, but um, it's just the, the other thing that always got me is the police bill were cornered off the, the street, right? So when he's coming up like Elm Street, Houston on the Elm, you see on the street, the people are like 10, 15 deep on the street. But then when you get into the kill zone in Dilly Plaza, right by the Texas School Book Depository, Policemen were cornered off that street, so they weren't letting in a lot of people in there. So that's why you see, like, where Kennedy was actually shot on the street there. You see, like, people here and there, but you don't see them 10, 15 deep. Right. And I always stop, Bill, if I'm thinking from a sniper's perspective, if I'm a sniper, I don't want 15 deep of people on the street, want, you know, right in front of the person I'm supposed to shoot. So that was a pretty important thing. Like, who gave right. that order to the police? Was that did that come from the mayor's office? And that's something I haven't really been able to figure out. Yeah, and that was that was another part of that uh, that scene with with Donald Sutherland, Mister X, when he's saying that he, you know, he would have been a part of that, and he said you would you would have felt an army presence on on the street that day, and none of that happened. And the thing is, Fletcher Prouty was sent by General Ed Lansdale, who was Alan Dulles's main guy in the military, but he was a CIA guy in the military. And he was sent by Lansdale to uh, the South Pole to, to babysit a bunch of diplomats, you know, and he always felt that, you know, he was taken out of the way so this could happen, you know? And he, he's the one that was referred to as General Y. Yes. And that, yeah. And that's, and he, he said, and Prouty said that, you know, Lansdale, was, there was a photograph of the tramps and there's a picture of a guy walking by the tramps and, uh, Prouty said that it was Lansdale. He identified him as General Ed Lansdale. Right. And Lansdale was one of the guys that was pushed out by Kennedy uh, because of what was going on in Vietnam. And Lansdale would end up getting back into, uh, you know, later on, he would be, after Kennedy's death, he would be assigned to uh, the embassy in Saigon. And he was running black ops in, in Vietnam once the war got started, once Johnson started the war. So Lansdale's a very suspicious character and, and Prouty always, you know, he, he sent that picture to, to other people that knew Lansdale and he didn't say nothing. He said, tell me what you see in this picture. And like eight people came back and they said, my God, that's, that's at Lansdale. And then of course the, the line, and I don't know if this line is, is just, uh, if it's just from the movie or, or if Garrison actually said this, but the line that uh, Kevin Costner says, let justice be, be done though the heavens fall, meaning let's get to the bottom of this, even if it tears this, you know, tears our, our country and our government apart. No, I believe that. I believe he did say that, Bill. Garrison yeah. did say that. Amazing. And here we are nearly, what, 60 years later, and we still don't really have all of the facts. We still don't have the whole story. We still well, don't. Again, Bill, they're holding up back all these files that are supposed to be declassified. Right. And that's why they're getting sued. Oh, we've got quite a month. We've got yeah. A, well, we could talk about we could talk about those uh, this movie forever, Bill. But I think uh, today let's let's just wrap it up. I want to wrap up with a couple stories uh, on our good friend Alan Dulles. Yeah. So, President Truman, Bill, right? Truman's the guy that set up the CIA basically with the National Security Act in 1947, and Truman never wanted the CIA to become what it became under Alan Dulles, which, you know, was a regime changing um, operations and, um, you know, assassination unit. It was not supposed to be that. It was supposed to be like a central gathering of information. And Truman was very upset with the CIA. And 
he wrote an article, Bill, and I believe the New York Times uh, put it out there, but the article was, was written and put out a month to the date of Kennedy's assassination. So it would have been December 22nd, 1963 that it came out. Yeah. And Truman slammed the CIA, slammed the CIA. And he, he basically said what I just said, that he never, be, he never wanted to be involved in assassinations and regime changes in, in other countries. I mean, this is not what the CIA was supposed to be all about. Now, he never mentioned Kennedy, and he never mentioned the assassination of, of JFK. But it's just, you know, ironic how he, he made sure that it came out a month to the date of the assassination. So Alan Dulles is, he's, uh, you know, he's really mad about this. And he wanted Truman to, to retract that story. So he set up, he went out to Missouri and visited with Truman and they had meetings, Bill, for a good part of the day. Like they met for like five, six hours and they were talking about, you know, how, you know, Dulles wanted him to retract and Truman just, he didn't want to, he's not retracting the story. So basically they, they agree to disagree. And, and Alan Dulles is leaving and Truman's walking him to the door and Dulles turns around and he says to Truman something to the effect of, you know, me and Jack Kennedy were not the enemies everybody made us out to be. And mm -hmm. Truman was just taken back. Like what kind of, like we just talked for five or six hours, never mentioned JFK, never mentioned the assassination. And this is what Alan Dulles has on his mind. Yeah. Like you talk about, you know, the suspicion of guilt. I mean, right. It's just amazing that that's what, you know, Dulles is thinking about, but that's where Dulles' mind was. You know, he, he realized Truman is blaming us for the assassination and I got to get this article retracted, you know, and it's just, it's just incredible. Alan Dulles. Amazing. And one last story I want to leave with, with Alan Dulles bill is um, there's a great book on him. The Devil's Chessboard by a guy by the name of David Talbot. Mm. Okay. And in that book, he talks about another researcher by the name of Peter Dale Scott, uh, who's, who's pretty famous. You've probably seen him, Bill, on documentaries. Um, but he, he was, uh, came from a prominent family. And in, the, in 63, the summer of 63, he's at um, the house of an of a entrepreneur by the name of Glenn Campbell, who uh, created uh, Stanford's Hoover Institute, which was like a government think tank, okay? And there was a lot of like powerful, like the 1% were there. I don't know the specifics of what people were actually at this party, but um, the story goes from uh, Peter Dale Scott is that everybody was ha having a dinner, they were talking there, and there was a priest there. He was a, a Russian Orthodox priest. He had the, the big crucifix. And he gave this, this uh, he stood up and he's, he's given this rant about communism, the evils of communism. And then the, the party, the people start to turn, this talking about Kennedy. And the, the waiter talking, Bill, like Peter Del Scott was taken back, like he couldn't believe the way these people are, are wealthy people. They're usually laid back and, you know, not a care in the world. And they just the, the level of hate they were talking about Kennedy just absolutely amazed them like how much they were calling him a traitor mm -hmm. and, and basically just saying, you know, the, the, all these bad things about him. And the priest stood up and he basically said, everybody calm down. He said, the old man is going to take care of it. So Peter Del Scott thought about it. And I think he talked to his dad about it. He said, boy, that old man Kennedy has a lot of clout. And his dad said, you know, he's not talking about old man Kennedy. Right. And Peter Del Scott thought about it at the time, Bill. Uh, old man Kennedy had a stroke by that time. The summer of 63. So old man Kennedy was in no position to give his son um, any advice at that point. But when he, when he talked and he, to other people and he did a lot of research himself, he realized that a lot of people, the clients of Sullivan, Sullivan and Cromwell law firm, like the Rockefellers and, and Henry Luce and people like that. And uh, CIA high ranking people like Alan Dulles, or I'm sorry, uh, David Atley Phillips, Richard Helms, E. Howard Hunt, all these people refer to Alan Dulles effectually as the old man. So basically, when that priest stands wow. up and he says, don't worry about anything, Alan Dulles is going to take care of it, just like he took care of Patrice Lumumba in the Congo, right. R. Benz in Guatemala, Mosaddegh in Iran, 
he's going to take care of this troublemaker, John Kennedy. Mm. And we'll leave it at that, Billy. Enough said, right? Enough said. And and we've got well, not enough said because we're get, we're doing we're doing a whole series. Enough said of, for today, Billy. Of show. Enough said for today, but 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 come back next week because we've got some some great content lined up this this entire month, the, the month of November. We're we're really going to focus on JFK. We've got uh, some some great episodes coming up. We've got a, a guest surprise guest that we'll we'll tell you a little bit more about when we get closer a little bit closer to the date uh but uh, some fantastic content this was a great show sean uh just as usual wealth of, of knowledge wealth of information and uh, this is what we do this is this is our show and this is how to get the truth out billy we want people to know right yeah, we want you to know the truth we we bring the truth every week on this show whether it's the the truth about these these historical events or uh, sometimes it's just our opinions on, on different things. But uh, for the most part, we're going to, we're going to bring you the truth. So if you like what you heard today, make sure you come back, make sure you uh, subscribe. Hit make that sure like you- button, hit subscribe, share this podcast, Billy, and then give us a review. And remember, hit the notification bell. So you get updated on future episodes. And uh, we are, on all the different podcast apps anywhere you can get a podcast and and if you if you're if you got a certain app that uh you search, <clears throat> you search for our show and we're not there let us know send me an email uh it's the email is that's enough out of you show at gmail.com that's enough out of you show at gmail.com it's all one word no punctuation or anything so send us an email let us know and you can find us on all the all the podcast apps. You can find us on YouTube. We've got uh, Facebook. We've got Twitter. We've got Instagram. So just search for us. We're out there. We're everywhere. We're covering the whole scene. We're, we got it all. We got it all covered, Sean. Keep that feedback coming. It's been tremendous, Billy. Yeah, we want to hear from you. and great, great feedback from the people. We want to hear from you. We want to know: Is there a topic you want us to talk about? Maybe uh, something that you know that we could talk about in a future show so uh yeah give us your feedback let us know and sean another great show all right buddy it's gonna be a big month in november we're excited about it and guess what that's enough out of you good night everybody